The National Association of Youth Organization, NIO, is a platform for youth organizations working in Zimbabwe, keen on contributing towards CSO effectiveness. What is CSO effectiveness and why is it important? In partnership with the CSO Partnership for Development Effectiveness, NIO is bringing to you CSO dialogues on the Istanbul principles to give voice to local non-state actors in the dialogues, we're having conversation with diverse CSO representatives. And in holding this, we are also celebrating the distinct nature of CSOs as development actors, that they are voluntary, diverse, nonpartisan, autonomous, nonviolent, working and collaborating for change. In our premier dialogue today, we have on the panel, Sarah Rusike and Taurai Charai Rai. I'm going to ask them to like really fully introduce themselves and the organizations that they're representing. Welcome, lady and gents. Thank you. Yeah. I'll start with you, Sarah. Please uh, introduce yourself fully and the organization you're representing. My name is Sarah Rusike from Trust and Trust, a youth advocate working on child rights. Organization, thank okay. Yeah. All right, great. And mm -hmm. yourself? Okay, thank you. My name is Taurai Chirai, right? Chirai, right. Okay, yes. great. <laughs> I work for an organization called Plafat, that is Global Action for Outdoors Development. We are more interested in issues of social and economic rights. Right. Uh, I didn't quite hear what Chosen does exactly. Chosen Trust focuses on the needs of vulnerable and often offices. offices. Okay. All right. Now well, that's fine. So this is Frank Talk with me, Yvonne, a platform where we bring together conversation that help build our nation. And as you have seen, we are pursuing our democracy conversations and we bring in this particular series brought to you by the National Association of Youth Organizations in partnership with CPDE. And uh, we want to talk about the Istanbul uh, principles. What are those? <laughs> I'll start with you. Okay, thank you. Uh, when you talk about the Istanbul uh, principles, mm. uh, they are part and parcel of a whole process of which was taking place under development cooperation. So the principle mainly uh, reinforced the position of civil society organizations as equal development partners in the development arena. As you are aware that uh, in development cooperation, we have uh, governments, uh, recipient governments and uh, donor agencies working together uh, to provide development to underprivileged nations. So the, the principles uh, came in as a result of the need uh, of the question which has been raised like uh, a civil society organization, which constitution, which, which constitute do you represent? Because if you look at parliamentarians, they are chosen by voters. Mm -hmm. If you look at the presidents, they, are, they, they go through a voter system. But for civil society organizations, it, is, it hasn't been the case. So the principles come in, therefore, to reinforce uh, that civil society are equal development uh, players. Right. And uh, Sarah? Okay, thank you. Um, to add on to what Mr. Chirayra said, um, Istanbul principles are CSO development and effectiveness principles approved in Istanbul. These principles help CSOs to, in the ways they, in the ways that they work with other partners and other by with other global partners and other and the government. Mm. Um, this includes respect of human rights, equality, environmental sustainability, and it ensures that development is not enforced on people, but people are included. So it is inclusive. Thank mm. you. Mm. I see that. I see jitters there, <laughs> Sarah. Just be at home, uh, be at home, because we what we want to do is to uh, get people to appreciate the work of uh, civic societies and what exactly it is that uh, governs you as a as, as a as civil society. So maybe uh, Taurai, you can just tell me how the instable principles relate to the wake of CSOs. Okay, thank you. Mm. In terms of how they relate to, to our work as civil society organization, every organization has a mission statement and a vision to, to, to sort of uh, accomplish. Mm. 
So in those visions uh, and mission statements, the principles, there are eight of them, they come into the force on the existing mission statements of, of, our local, of civil society organizations. So what they do is just to put a benchmark in terms of uh, how then do we do, for example, because there are eight principles. So they just, for example, issues the principle one on respect of human rights mm -hmm. uh, and social justice. It just states that in the work which we are doing in civil society organization, we should put some form of respect to those issues. So issues around gender, issues around accountability, transparency. So it's, it's they, they sort of guide civil society organization. Mm -hmm. well. so like you have your mandate, but make sure you also uh, adhere, uphold, uphold yeah, yeah. The, the, the principles. Uh, it's, it's quite interesting because, um, you know, as I was just uh, doing a little bit of research on the Instable principles and stuff, I also realized that uh, the issue that you raised, the issue of human rights, um, and we come back to Zimbabwe a little bit, uh, there, there's the current bill that is going through parliament, the uh, private voluntary organizations, uh, PVO bill. Now, I, I want to know um, the effects of this PVO amendment bill on the work of CSO. So I'll start with you, uh, Sarah. Okay, the PVO amendment bill infringes on the rights of provided for in section 58 of the constitution, which provides freedom of association, freedom of movement is guaranteed by the Supreme law. Mm. So by amending this, people are, in their rights are infringed and uh, their privacy is also infringed. Um, the PVO amendment bills has led to the shrinking of the civic space and also it has impacted on the privacy of individuals. Thank you. Okay, so you speak about the shrinking of uh, civic space as well as infringement of uh, a, a human's right. Maybe you can actually go deeper into that. What does that even mean? Do people even understand the scope of this uh, PVO amendment? Mm -hmm. What exactly is it and how does it infringe on their rights and how does it shrink civic space? I think to be fair to the discussion, we yeah. have to start with why the bill came into place. Right. Because to it was a response of government to sort of, there is a UN task, task force which uh, is in charge of issues around terrorism and financial laundering. Right. So in 2018, uh, Zimbabwe was mandated to sort of conform to recommendations number eight, which deals with the two issues. Mm -hmm. So government was then supposed to respond to that, to put in place uh, legislation that ensures that uh, civil society organizations do not go past their mandate. For example, mm -hmm. uh, then engage in issues of money laundering, uh, financing terrorism, mm -hmm. And, and th th those were the main uh, sort of aspects which led uh, our, our government to come up with the PVO uh, uh, amendments. So the amendments themselves in terms of uh, getting to uh, sort of come, in, come to task, sort of to avoid in terrorism and financial mm. uh, laundering, they take the box there. But as uh, Sarah mentioned, that uh, the government went on to put on other clauses, uh, which we as a civil society organization feel uh, they sort of uh, go then to sort of uh, shrink civic space. Uh, how do they shrink civic space? Yes. If you look at the issues of uh, clause number, should be clause number two of the bill, which talks of issues around registration of, uh, of, of private voluntary uh, uh, organizations. First, there was no fee to it. You could just go and register your PVO. But now the bill then empowers uh, uh, the ministry to put a fee to it. So it sort of put, makes it exclusionary to sort of uh, okay. organizations which are like sort of grassroots based and have no financial uh, power at its exception to, 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 to sort of um, fund those bills. And then in terms of uh, the, the, defin the, the definition of a uh, private voluntary organization, mm. what the actual bill does uh, sort of expand uh, the definition of uh, PVOs to include uh, trusts. So trusts are then, uh, they, they, they are registered uh, within the High Court of Zimbabwe. So this bill now, it brings down the registration so that it, they, 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 they become registered under the PVO Act. So what it means, it therefore shrinks uh, the financial power of uh, already existing organizations who are registered as trusts. 
mm. in that way because the, 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 there's close uh, there's another clause also which uh, prohibits trusts to sort of look for funding locally and abroad uh, if they are not registered as PVOs. So what it does is therefore shrinks the, the financial base of uh, most CSOs who are registered as trusts. So mm. it becomes a problem. But in terms of, we cannot say that because uh, 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 civil society organizations have no history of loan, money laundering in Zim, we have no history of financing terrorism, uh, that's because we don't have such prior background, those laws should be in place. I think they're still uh, quite important, but the, the bill has to sell through without these uh, restrictive measures, which affects already uh, uh, existing organizations, which we have been working within their mandates uh, to deliver. Uh, Wow, okay, quite interesting. So uh, this is um, the Civic Society Dialogue Series that uh, is coming to you in partnership with uh, National Association of Youth Organizations and the CPDE uh, right here on Zimbabwe Daily. And we want to really appreciate uh, the role that civic society uh, plays when it comes to uh, development as development agents in our nation. Why is it critical that we have these organizations? And if they are critical, what is it that governs them? So we see the PVO bill coming on board and uh, the different uh, clauses that have been inserted in the curtailing the work of uh, uh, civic society and stuff like that. But I just, I still need to um, get this understanding. Um, we have the the PVO bill coming through as a government mechanism to help uh, fight what you called um, financial terrorism and um, money laundering. Does the Istanbul principle talks about any of that? Yes, the Istanbul talks Istanbul principles talks about that um, they encourage accountability and transparency. Right. So for SEOs to, to be recognized as developmental actors, they have to be accountable and transparent in, and transparent in everything that they do. Right. And when we um, when we look at at at, at that. We're talking of uh, sustainable development goals, and uh, as a nation, we still have NDS one National Development Strategy one, and there are some development trajectories that we want to achieve. Now, when we then look at uh, the instable principles, are they in any way, um, what can I say, making you as CSOs accountable? and also partners with existing governments to push for the attainment of these SDGs. Okay, when you look at now the sustainable development mm. goals, uh, they're quite important. And um, currently we can say uh, Zimbabwe is a bit off track in terms of uh, achieving the SDGs. Right. Uh, many... When you talk off track, we are like <laughs> zero to 10 on <laughs> It's okay, please go ahead. <laughs> I'm so, just trying to be funny. <laughs> so the principles, yeah, the, the instable principles, they don't work alone. They work with uh, a whole lot of other principles right. uh, in the development cooperation frameworks. So there are the Busan Partnership Agreement of 2011, it also came up with uh, four major principles, mm -hmm. which are quite important in terms of uh, ensuring that we achieve uh, the SDGs. Right. So these principles, uh, they sort of give uh, us a voice, a civil society organization, to state that in terms of achieving the SDGs, uh, give us space so that we contribute, because they want the SDG is an over, uh, agenda to, 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 to eradicate poverty in all its forms. Right. So, uh, the, the, the principles are together with the whole development cooperation frameworks. It gives us a standing point mm -hmm. to help government uh, in terms of uh, achieving the SDGs. So I think that's what I can say for now. Okay, uh, yeah, please okay, go ahead. to add on the instable principles, mm -hmm. place the concept of CSO accountability at the center of global partnerships. Right. Um, include to all the when we all are working towards poverty reduction. So it is essential for us to recognize the work of CSOs and put it into progress reports on SDGs. Also, 
ESW principles work in sync with the sustainable development goals. Mm -hmm. uh, when we look at the IP of equality, gender equality, when we look at the IP of inclusion, when we look at the IP of environmental sustainability. Uh, IP to somebody who, who doesn't, <laughs> you know, what does that mean? Okay, IP means it's a principle. Okay, okay, <laughs> right. <laughs> it's IP, IP. <laughs> okay, please go ahead. They are all working towards strengthening these sustainable development goals. Right. So why is accountability important? Accountability is important so that um, partners working with the CSOs mm -hmm. increase their confidence in the CSOs. For example, there's this narrative that CSOs are um, money-making tools. Um, the, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so if there's accountability, there's transparency, and we can erase that narrative that CSOs are money-making tools rather than mm -hmm. working for the good of the public. Right. Money-making tools and... Uh... <laughs> I, I on what she is saying. Yeah, maybe um, also just to answer how, um, you, you know... So accountability comes in, let me put it in a two-straight uh, format. The first one whereby, uh, as an organization, your funders, they need to know what you're doing. Right. So most CSOs, they take the box in that respect whereby you get funding for a, from, for a, a donor. Then when the project ends, you provide your uh, project reports and uh, your learning, your key learnings. Right. Uh, for what are the future <laughs> prospects after the project, which then takes you to the next funding cycle. So when they report, when these reports get into the donors, they are quite important in the sense that those reports are then used by the donor agencies to report to their own governments mm -hmm. because that money will be coming from national governments. Uh, I think uh, they are the clinic those commitments in which uh, donor organizations are pledging, uh, pledging to 0.7% of their gross national income towards uh, uh, aid mm -hmm. for development effectiveness. So that's how the cycle works. If we don't account the CSOs, it right. means that we 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 cut our justification for for for, for further funding to, to 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 engage in our in our mandate, and the other part of accountability is uh, at the local level in which you are doing your projects. Uh, you you cannot just I cannot just come into your house and say I want to build a toilet for you without. Uh, uh, who asking, told you we use the toilet? <laughs> without asking first, do you even use toilets, for example? Yeah. So right. if you if you if, if if you are account your mandate to at the local level, it mm. strengthens your 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 impact of the work which you are doing. So it's quite important in the sense that uh, if 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 CSOs we are accountable at the local level, we mm. understand the local dynamics. What is it that uh, our communities are lacking? How then can we intervene to ameliorate that that that, that sort of uh, shortcoming? So uh, without accountability, basically, we have no work to do. Right. Yeah. And is that not what government is asking you to do with the with the PVO bill as well and the um, provincial development mm -hmm. coordinators asking you to report? I mean, I've seen a, a major outcry in the CSO when the provincial um, uh, development coordinators, the PDCs, came through and said, we want to know what you're doing and stuff like that and you guys are like no we can't because you, why do you want to know we already report to so and so and stuff like that um and I'm, maybe it's going to be a conversation for another day but i want to know uh some of the ways that as csos you are accountable not just to the local communities or to the to the funders of a project but also to um the national governance system okay. that's for the both of you so anyone can go <laughs> okay thank you um csos can ensure accountability in their work um when they are being clear to whom reporting is appropriate right mm -hmm. this should include sharing information on the csos to key stakeholders and their role in holding CSOs accountable. Also, reporting on the specific benefits of including civil society within SDG planning and mm -hmm. accountability cycles. Mm. Mr. Tara. I think she has said basically <laughs> a lot in terms of how accountability can be enhanced by uh, CSOs. 
I think uh, what was important, like who are you, who are you being accountable to? I think at the start of the discussion, I mentioned that uh, a civil society we had a shortcoming in which, like, which mandate, who mandated you mm. to do what you are mm. doing? So when we are uh, account to the local, uh, to, to, to our communities, like uh, we we have this project, so it means the local the local leadership has to know the local government at local government level they have to know mm. uh, what we what we intend to do i cannot get into a word uh, without uh, no without letting know the the, the local at the local government level mm. or even informing the police that uh, we, we want to do this because uh, there are there are laws for example if you want to gather people there right. are some people who should know so that's that that that's where it it, it is quite important and then uh, there's another aspect of accountability which I think is important for us to raise. Like, for example, uh, there are some important government documentation which does not cascade uh, to, 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 the, to the local person, to the local person in the street. Right. So uh, it's, it's another opportunity whereby, for example, CSOs can use, for example, Auditor General reports to state that, do you know that uh, what government promised to do uh, is not being done? And also civil society can even ask uh, the, parla the parliamentarians to account uh, for what exactly they are doing in parliament using mm. taxpayers' money. Mm. So there are a whole lot of frameworks in which a civil society organization can I'm on and the problem is that we raffle my feathers. If I go put it, put it. What did I do? I want to say, "Can't you put it here?" I go to go to Paris. I pop. I just pop up no so far. Can I? Oh no! Thank you so much uh, for coming through to just have this um, conversation. Uh, talking about the Instable principles that have been raised. If you have never heard about the Instable. Uh, principles then this conversation you have to listen to it and you just go to google and you get just it's a one page document that speaks about the eight principles uh that governs how uh civic society organizations should and are operating in and around zimbabwe is not the only country that has a cso so don't 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 mind i know that this time around conversations around this all seem to be a lot because there are a lot of advocacy issues that zimbabwe is raising as we try to build a democratic society uh, that we want to build as a nation so i want to thank uh, sarah and Sarai for speaking passionately about the works that you guys are doing i we didn't go deeper into the work that you actually do, but we now know that you deal with uh, orphans and vulnerable children, and we know what exactly do you do? <laughs> Social economic justice issues. Social economic justice issues, and um, unless you know these things, sometimes you can be passionate about those issues and not know where to go. So we have Taurai here, we have Sarah here. They are people that you can plug into and actually help uh, help our country as we go towards a developmental trajectory, fighting poverty throughout. Hallelujah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so guided by these instable principles, CSOs are committed to take proactive actions to improve and be fully accountable to their development um, for their development practices. Equally important will be enabling policies and practices by all actors as witnessed in today's session. In closing, the partnership and collaboration between CPDE and youth in Zimbabwe is giving voice to non-state actors and evidencing the effectiveness of CSOs. I thank you and be sure to join us for our next dialogue session in the next uh, two weeks. This is Frank Talk with me, Yvonne Muchaka. Thanks a lot to our crew behind the scenes and thanks to my guests on the show and thank you to our partners at National Association of Youth Organizations and CPDE for allowing and enabling this conversation to take place. Do join us again next week. It's bye-bye for now.